Okay, okay. Uh, we're ready for uh, uh, for the Creativity Masterclass of 2022, and uh, it is my pleasure to to welcome to our class tonight, uh, Caterina Cabanelli. Uh, Caterina uh, is the perfect person to to have with us to talk about creativity through the lifespan. She has uh, she has been born and raised in very creative surroundings. She has studied uh, design and theater in Greece in the United Kingdom. Uh, she has spent a lifetime and career in the collaborative art of the theater. She also done work for the cinema as a designer, as a scenographer, a costume designer. So I'm really looking forward to her, uh, sorry, her experiences uh, as an individual doing creative stuff, as a creative collaborator, working with other creative people, uh, with directors in the theater uh, and, uh, and other zones. At the same time, Katarina uh, is also the curator of the uh, uh, Jakovos uh, uh, Cabanelli's uh, archive. Uh, Jakovos Cabanelli's, uh, her late uh, father, uh, of the most significant, perhaps the most significant theatrical writer of, of, of modern Greece, uh, has made a very important contributions not only in the theater, but also in the cinema, uh, in lyrics uh, for music, uh, and of course with a great uh, uh, novel, large biographical about his experience in Mount Housing. So uh, 2022 is also the year for the Greek Ministry of Culture uh, dedicated to the memory and the creative work of Iakovos Kabanelli. So it's an interesting uh, side expression of creativity to be a curator, to really look at the heritage, try to protect it and also express it in different ways. So lots of things for us to, uh, to hear and learn and discuss with Katerina uh, tonight. Katerina, thank you so much uh, for joining us. And, thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Menemelis. We, I'm sure. very, very glad to be here. Floor thank is you. yours. We're just going to follow your presentation and then the second part, uh, I'm sure we have a very, uh, uh, a very directed group. The second part after your presentation is over, we are going to engage and ask questions. Floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much for having me here and bear with me with my a little knowledge of technology and my little and my rusty English. Anyway, um, I would like to start uh, talking about a little bit about my father uh, and uh, Babis uh, talked before uh, to you about him. Uh, he was uh, um, the most important um, Greek uh, playwright. Um, and the um, he, he was a multitasking person, and that is why he was uh, uh, my source of inspiration for whatever I did uh, after in my life. Um, so he wrote uh, uh, more than 40 uh, plays for the theater, and uh, he wrote the uh, lyrics for songs and uh, scenarios for the cinema. Uh, he also wrote a lot of essays a lot of articles in newspapers, I forgot that before, a lot of articles in newspapers and um, speeches that he made, that he made uh, in various occasions. And uh, of course, he has written uh, the only uh, uh, chronicle. Uh, he hasn't written another book, just one, a chronicle from his experience in Mauthausen. Uh, he was a prisoner there for two and a half years. Uh, until the Liberation Day in 1945. Um, and of course, he has written the four songs, uh, maybe most of you have heard, uh, that uh, Theodorakis uh, uh, put music in. And um, But uh, he was a multitasking person. He didn't only write. He liked very much to draw and sketch, as you can see here. Uh, I have uh, four of his sketches, uh, which um, I believe they are very theatrical and very uh, cinematographical. I don't know the word. And uh, he also liked to make uh, small sculptures like this one you can see here. Um, so he was uh, all the time uh, doing things. Um, which had to do with uh, art. Uh, he also carved the wood a lot. So he always wanted to do something with um, something that was uh, uh, that was related with art. 
So I had him for an example in my life and um, I will explain to you. Uh, I will. I would like to talk to you why I, I become I became a theater designer. Uh, we start from, uh, of course, from my father, who was a theater person, and uh, inevitably I grew up into the theater world. Uh, he used to take me with him in rehearsals and um, performances, uh, so I had uh, the great opportunity to meet and um, to meet uh, Carlos Kuhn and uh, Jenny Carezzi and Kostas Kazakos and other very important theater persons here in Greek. Um, everybody of every one of them influenced me. I must confess that. Anyway, when I start, when I um, when I finished school, I went to the university, and because um, everybody had to go to the university at that time, um, I went to uh, a, sco a school and name for uh, who was political sciences. Uh, I was very glad at first that I got into the university, but um, after the first year, I realized that I didn't want to be there at all. It didn't express me at all. So I, I dropped out, I never finished. And at the same time, I got involved in a theatrical team. And uh, there I, I met very closely the the way uh, you have to follow to make theater. And all this theater process uh, really enchanted me and uh, also the result. So I realized theater was the right path I should follow, it was the right uh, profession that I should follow. And um, it was inevitable for me, I think, after all this experience I had all my life in theater. So um, because I used to, to draw uh, well, as my father said, and he believed very much in my drawing, he consulted me to become a theater designer. And um, I liked the idea. So I enrolled the Vagalo Art and Design College and uh, there I studied the uh, interior design at first. And as there were no theater design studies in Greece, I had to go abroad. So I chose to go to Wimbledon School of Art, one of the best uh, colleges in London uh, for theater design. And um, since then, I, I stayed there for years. I studied theater design and uh, I really, it was the best years of my life. Um, and, now, and since then I have been working on many, many plays. I mean, to, uh, since then until, uh, for example, okay, two, 2011 when my father died, I kind of stopped. I will explain you later why, uh, but I had one or two works since then. So um, I would like to talk to you about the, the skills and knowledge required to become a um, theater designer. It's not an easy uh, profession at all because it combines lots and lots of things. So you have to study among other things, history of art, history of theater, history of fashion and costume, history of architecture, technical design, which is necessary if you want to make uh, uh, sets. Uh, you have to have a good knowledge of 20th century artists and movements as the 20th century is the most important century in art. And it's because there were great evolution in art in 20th century um, and because we set designers, we quite often use uh, the 20th century movements in our sets. Um, you have to have an optimistic point of view and imagine, imagination, of course, creativity. You have to be social. 
you have to get along well with other people and um, you have to have uh, collaborative skills. Um, advisable is traveling and visiting the great museums of the world for a more extended and open-minded viewpoint. I have tried during my life to go to as many museums as I can in Europe um, to collect as many art books as possible. On the right, you can see a part of my collection. I have a whole bookcase full of art books. Uh, read as many plays, watch as many performances as possible and movies, of course. And uh, theater is a teamwork. A lot of professionals are involved in the theater. First of all, you have um, the director, who is the boss, who is above all. Of course, you have the producer uh, who has the money. You can't have a performance without a producer. Um, you have the, of course, the writer, if he's alive or if he's dead, uh, you don't have the writer. And uh, the director can do almost anything he can with the play. Um, you have the uh, theater designer, set designer and costume designer, or one who combines both. Uh, you have the musician, the composer, the lighting designer, uh, the choreographer, uh, the moving, is, moving is instructor, uh, and of course the actors. Okay, you have to collaborate everybody with everybody. It is viral, vital. So uh, to start with the work, of the, um, I, I will talk for me, of course, and uh, the theater designer, you have to study carefully and in depth the play you are given, which means that you have to read it uh, not only once, but five or six times and take notes. Notes, uh, for example, uh, for the play, for the place, uh, the time, um, the um, roles, the characters. Uh, with, uh, the other good thing is to um, examine the background of the writer. Uh, this has been very useful to me many times because uh, reading about the life of the writer, I understand uh, why he wrote uh, the play, um, what are his experiences, etc. Uh, you have to understand the characters, you have to study the characters, um, and uh, the meanings behind the words, if it's, uh, if it's a symbolic play um, or, or if it is a play of the irrational, you have re to, re to really study it and uh, search for the meanings behind the words. Um, of course, you have to cooperate with the actors uh, because actors are the mean that brings into, onto the stage everything you have thought and everything you had, um, uh, every idea you had. Uh, so you have to study their physique and their posture. You have to study their body, the color of their skin, everything, because it is very, um, very, very important that they feel uh, comfortable in their costume that they feel uh, they can develop their role into their costume. There has been many uh, cases, uh, not in, uh, with me, but other uh, costume designers, that um, the actor didn't like the costume and he tried to change it because he didn't feel comfortable in it. Um, and once I had an experience, a bad experience, with an actress who was a little chubby and um, the dress I had uh, designed, uh, it wasn't looking very nice at all on her and she felt very bad. So she couldn't really uh, play the role with this uh, dress and I had to change it, et cetera, et cetera. So you have this kind of uh, problem sometimes. 
Um, of course, you have to study properly the stage that you're going to stage set because it's very important if it is a round stage, if it is a rectangular stage, et cetera, et cetera. Make technical designs, which helps a lot. Um, and the, the secret is to keep constant communication with the director. The director is the boss. He's uh, the boss and he has the first and last word uh, in everything you do and everything you suggest. Of course you suggest. Uh, many directors are very open to suggestions uh, and uh, the most creative uh, um, the most creative stage is to um, to discuss with the director your ideas and uh, he tells something more on your ideas and you say something more on his ideas and so it goes on and then you grow up a very good relationship and uh, you grow a very good result at the end which is uh, convenient mainly to the director and it is very good for you as well because you sign you sign the set at the end and the costumes so um, everything has to work together i mean your work my work has to work with director's work if you can understand what i'm going and what i mean um you have to sketch everything that comes up in mind so we have these uh, kind of sketchbooks here, if you can see, I have about 30 of these uh, where I sketch everything, if you can see. And um, I, I write down any, every information that comes into my mind. I sketch this. Uh, you sketch up costumes, you sketch up uh, references uh, like that. I was searching for costumes from the Orient in the play. Um, and uh, you also have many cards of uh, people who would be useful to make your, um, your set, like um, uh, iron. Um, how do I tell them? Uh, carpenters and iron makers and shoe makers and hat makers and dress makers. You have to have information about all these people. Um, for example, here I have a, I worked in a play which required old furniture. So I had to find a lot of old furniture to photograph them. And each time I showed them to the director and he said if he likes them or not. Um, and uh, the challenging thing is that you have to, to expect the changes in your ideas and in your uh, set and costume, even at the last moment during the process, because the director can come with ideas that he didn't think of them before. Um, and he can uh, really surprise you by asking almost the impossible. But as I write down here, as you can see, impossible is not an option. You can't say the, to the director, this is impossible. You have to go to sit down and find solution to anything he can think about. And uh, the other uh, the other uh, profession that you can you, you have to collaborate very closely is the lighting designer because uh, he is the one that uh, will uh, make your costumes and sets uh, show properly and perfectly on stage uh, it has happened to me once i remember i had a very bad lighting designer who was not cooperative at all and in the end he didn't light up my set uh, as it should, and it came out very bad. Um, and the last uh, thing you have to do is to attend uh, as many rehearsals as possible. Uh, me, myself, go almost to every rehearsal because uh, I have to follow the director's 
orders and the director's ideas be, because many times they change every day and uh, adapt my plans according to these new ideas. Um, and always, of course, be there at the final rehearsal or the final rehearsals. Sometimes there are more than one. And the um, and the work on your costumes mainly because the sets they're supposed to be ready. The costumes that you have to work until the last moment. I would like to show you some of my work. This is the first work I did ever in 1994. It was called the Dragon. Well, I, I'm showing you my sketches, of course. Um, it was called The Dragon. It was a play by Evgeny Svart. A very difficult play. Um, but I, I did a good work because I had a very good director. We worked uh, together very well. And um, I, I also uh, gained the three prizes in theater festivals for these costumes. The other play I would like to show you is The Supper. It is one of my father's plays, 1997. Uh, this play has uh, three one-act plays. Here I have the model of the two uh, plays. And again, one act plays, three one act plays at the, at the experimental stage of National Theatre in 1997. Uh, it was also the first, the first performance in the experimental stage. And the difficulty here again was that there were three one act plays, different one act plays from different writers. And I had to come up with uh, three different sets that would change in a, blink of an eye, let's say. Another uh, case here is The Love of the Nightingale by Timberlake Wettenbaker, 1998. Uh, here I had to do everything myself. I didn't have um, costume makers. I didn't have uh, carpenters. I didn't have uh, set painters. I painted myself the set here, as you can see which came out quite good because um, it feels like it has a movement. And it is uh, quite a simple uh, method, this one. I just threw paint in the wall, on the wall with uh, brushes and it came like that. Um, and I had to make myself the costumes and uh, of course, uh, and paint them at the same time. Uh, here I had, everybody. Here it was a big production. It was Viva Aspasia in 2000 in a very, uh, very renowned theater. <clears throat> and it was a play which took place in 1940s during the Second World War. And it was quite in, uh, interesting for me because I had to design um, the house, the, the living room of the house at of this time and also the costumes it was very nice and uh, the other play was um, which was quite difficult for me was miss margarita's way by roberto attainde in 2001 in a big theater again uh, miss margarita was uh, played by the, the famous yorgos marinos Everybody, I think you should know him. And um, the, the difficult thing was that the director asked me to have a, a, a piece of cloth from one side of the stage to the other, uh, which in Greek we call it horizontas, horizon, and uh, it shouldn't have any uh, seams. It should be a whole cloth. So this kind of cloth uh, does not, did not exist at that time in Greece. So I had to search where I could find it. And I found it in Germany and we ordered it in Germany. So it was a, you can't see it here in the model, but 
<laughs> we ordered it in Germany and it came a whole, pi a whole piece of cloth without any seam um, that uh, surrounded the stage. And it was quite, uh, quite impressive, I must say, because if you light it from in, in front, um, you can't see anything uh, at behind. And if you light it from behind, you can see things happening behind the cloth. Uh, at, the part, at this particular uh, performance, uh, the um, director had asked me to put multiple margaritas at be behind the cloth so that when he lit it, uh, you, could, you could see a multiple uh, teacher, because Miss Margarita was a teacher, uh, multiple teachers, uh, which was quite uh, like a nightmare, let's say. Uh, here is another play, 2002, which was called A Comedy, uh, again from my, by my father's, one of my father's plays. And this was staged in uh, Irodion, um, a dancing theater. And here we had other difficulties. Uh, we should uh, make, uh, I should make a, 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 a set which did not offend the, the ancient theater, the ancient uh, stones. And of course, it shouldn't uh, touch the ancient uh, stones. So I remember uh, we spent uh, one whole night there to put up the set and uh, we were watching uh, the people who set it up with uh, an archaeologist who was watching very um, strictly uh, the way we, we set it up and uh, so that it doesn't touch at all the ancient uh, stones. And here I would like to talk to you about this uh, performance um, in, in 2018, Midnight Summer's Dream. Uh, one of the most difficult plays I've ever worked. Uh, it was um, an, ama an amateur's uh, performance, but in a very professional way, made in, in a very professional way. Again, the director was uh, a friend of mine and we had a great collaboration. Um, so I would like to talk to you a little bit about the process. Uh, at first, uh, uh, this, is the, this was the stage, that it was staged, which was semi-round, and it had two trees in it, you can see them, uh, which was quite convenient for me because uh, the play takes place in the forest. So it was okay. Here are the, some uh, uh, research I did for, to have an inspiration for the background, for the forest, for example, and for the palace, because it takes place in the forest and in the palace, two different. Uh, of course, I didn't use anything of any of that, but it does doesn't have any uh, importance. Uh, I I really needed to have some background for myself, so I did two models as you can see, and one with the palace and one with the forest. Uh, if I had the opportunity, I would love to do this with the palace, uh, because I really like the, the, the abstract uh, form. And then uh, I had to search for the costumes, some inspiration uh, sources. I really like the, the left uh, picture, uh, with the Oberon and Titania. I really like the, um, the hair and, uh, and the costumes. I didn't uh, use this kind of hair. I used, uh, I, I put uh, on their head the uh, two crowns made of um, wood sticks. And these are uh, some of the flowers and the uh, web uh, cob. Web pop. Just like it, they all stars are like. Uh, anyway, um, you can see uh, pictures 
that I searched. These are very some of the pictures that I searched for the to have a inspiration. I really like the, this uh, right the picture with the Titania coming out of a tree, and uh, that that uh, thing on her head that's really inspired me to make her the crown made of wood sticks and. Uh, uh, Yes, and the, the other are the um, wedding dresses and dresses in general that I used in um, in the other actors. And here are some, you see, you can see the, the crowns I told you about of Oberon and Titania. And these are the, the elves, the fairies. And the two couples. And you can see on the right the, the wedding dress. And here is something that I'm very proud of, the donkey head. And I tried to, I didn't know how to do a donkey head. So I, I really searched a lot. And I came up with this kind of um, like an origami, let's say which was quite difficult, but very amusing to make. So I made this one and uh, I think it was a big success. And these are some uh, snapshots from the performance. Okay. And now I will proceed to talk to you a little bit about how my life changed in 2011 when my father passed away. Um, I always kept in mind that um, I'm going to inherit uh, all this um, legacy that he left, but I had it on the back of my mind. I didn't really think about it very often. So when he died, I went to the, his house and started looking for material everywhere. In uh, that was his desk, by the way, the desk that he was he has written all his plays. Um, I tried to look for uh, things everywhere in cupboards, in uh, drawers, in a little storage room he had in his house, in boxes, everywhere. Um, and I found a lot, a lot of things. And uh, not only the, no, the, the known plays, but I found also plays that I didn't know about. And uh, they were not published. And I found the poems. Um, and I found the scenarios that I didn't know about. And of course, all of his essays that I didn't know about, and the speeches. So I decided, um, together with my uh, colleague, um, Thanos Foscarinis, who is, uh, who is um, um, a studied theater, and he was a great admirer of my father's, uh, we started to make, uh, to start making the archive. Uh, the archive uh, took us about um, five years. Uh, to collect everything and to categorize it and to put it into folders. Behind me, you can see some of the folders we have made um, with all the, everything we found. And um, at the same time, we decided to collect all the poems because nobody ever collected all of his poems. And at the end, we, we made this book, we uh, published this book, which is called the uh, Tifoni Mukela, Listen to My Voice and Come Near. Um, and um, I think it's a very important collection because as I said, nobody ever collects them in a book. And um, 
Besides that, I have I have the archives now in my house, but uh, sometime after I uh, make it digital, I don't know the verb in English, uh, I will uh, donate it uh, probably at the National Library. I haven't decided yet, but this will happen in, um, in the future sometime. Okay, so I was I was uh, talking about the Campanelli's Theatre Museum in Axos, um, uh, which uh, for, for which I'm very proud as well, uh, apart from the archive, because we managed to um, to bring to Naxos uh, many of his personal belongings and many of his prizes and. Um, I can show you here his uh, desk, as you said before, and his bookcase. And uh, at the background, you can see um, the, um, uh, the um, how can you say, Parasimo, uh, the decorations that he was uh, given by the uh, president of the uh, Republic. And here you can see some of the parts of the museum with uh, all of his uh, uh, honorable um, uh, things and uh, his art craft and his books. And um, I'm, I must say that uh, um, comparing uh, this work I have done uh, about my father's uh, inheritance uh, comparing it to the theater design, uh, I find that they are both very creative. Um, because, uh, for example, all this exhibition, I did it myself. I put the things into the shelves and everything. And uh, that was quite an experience because it was the first time I've done something like that. And um, at the, to, uh, these days that we are preparing uh, all the um, uh, festivities, let's say, yeah, for the uh, literary year uh, 2022, which is dedicated to my father. Um, I am preparing um, with some other uh, collaborators a big exhibition at the Benaki Museum, which is also a very, uh, fun, very unique experience to gather all the material and to decide which uh, which uh, things we are going to exhibit and all of this. And it is, uh, I find it quite um, uh, creative in a different way, of course, uh, than the, the theater design. Um, I, I, do not, uh, I do not miss theater design very much because I think and I feel that this work that I'm doing to keep my father's work and try to um, try to uh, take it further, let's say, is much more creative and it's much more important uh, than uh, just do a theatre design. And um, I really feel that I'm doing something important. Uh, ah, these are the decorations from the. Um, from the president of the republic that my father got. And uh, that's all from me. Um, special thanks to Mr. Menemelis and to all of you who attended this masterclass. And I would like to thank my daughter who helped me a lot with this presentation. I'm open to questions. Thank you, Katarina. Thank you very much uh, to you and to your daughter. <laughs> for, for, You're for, for, for the, it's always important to acknowledge the collaborations, uh, the collaborators. Okay, may I please ask you to stop sharing so we can just see you okay. on the screen and we can uh, uh, we can uh, get back to uh, uh, whoever likes. You can just turn on your camera, guys. It's up to you. Uh, but we can uh, open it up to to questions, starting with Adonis. Hello again. First of Hello. all, thank you for uh, sharing your experience with us. It's an honor having you in today's class. I will be very brief so the others can ask too. 
Uh, I just wanted to, to ask this. You mentioned at some point in your presentation that you are constantly working with very creative people. And that's very normal because you are in the in a very artistic environment. Uh, do you find it very difficult when uh, two creative people need to collaborate because they both have their own creative ideas and they are strong characters? So how do you manage when you come across, for example, very difficult uh, directors or actors or other kind of professionals yes. to engage with? Very, very good question. Very good question. Uh, it has happened to me, this. Um, I mean, I, it has happened to, to me to work with a very famous and very important director and who was also older than me. And uh, I had the great respect for him. So um, I didn't have a big chance to share with him my ideas because he was very, very, um, from the beginning, he, he knew what he wanted. Uh, so he told me, you do that and that and that and that. So I didn't have any chance to think about something else. So I respected all of his ideas and I just uh, executed them. Uh, but um, what is most creative for me is to have um, a person uh, that is, uh, and not necessarily my age, but, um, you know, to listen to me. That is most, most crea more creative. Uh, to exchange opinions and to exchange ideas. And so we can, uh, we can uh, help each other to uh, reach a point that is quite uh, sufficient and quite satisfying for both of us and mainly for the director, of course. But uh, it happens many times to be with a person who is more dynamic than you. I'm not dynamic at all, so I, I, I uh, submit to their to their uh, desires. I'm trying to make them feel uh, better. Thank you very much for your input. You're welcome. Thank you, Doni. Uh, Stavro. Thank you also very much for this presentation and also congratulations for your effort to, to collect this archive. It's very important, honestly. And also let me comment, let me say a comment here. I, I feel that it's very important also for the country because via such an archive, we can also follow the history of the country. Yes, so it's, that's it's true. a very, very important work, uh, to be You're honest. You're absolutely right. Thank yes. you for that. Maybe a short question also from my side. You commented uh, uh, regarding the a collaboration you had with directors, so a good collaboration uh, generates a, a positive output then for, for your work as well. So could you please name uh, some of the characteristics, the criteria or conditions under which such a collaboration can be successful? Let's say organic interaction or um, very competent, uh, I do not know, director? Yes, um, I will tell you an example of my father's. Uh, when my father worked with Carlos Kuhn, and uh, you all know how important Carlos Kuhn was and uh, how experienced director and experienced uh, theater person, uh, Carlos Kuhn always wanted my father there next to him in the rehearsals. Um, and not only that, he also asked him, Jacobos, what do you think? Am I doing it well? I mean, these kind of persons, I don't, I don't want the director to ask me if he's doing it well, but um, I would like to ask me, um, what do you think we should do here to achieve that, for example? I mean, so that I will be able to, um, to, to tell him my ideas or to find solutions. I'm, I'm very uh, keen on the searching for solutions into difficult problems. Sometimes, of course, I get desperate, but uh, it is very challenging to provoke me to find solutions in problems. Um, th that is what I mean. That is what I feel that it is very a good collaboration uh, to ask you for your opinion uh, on things and on for your ideas on problems. That, that's, that's what I mean. 
Thank you very much. You're welcome. Clear, clear host. <laughs> Okay, thank you for the presentation. I would like to ask, you, you are the daughter of a legendary personality. Uh, this is a competitive advantage. It's a bless or a curse. Uh, well, you are anxious whether you, you will be able to, to be as good as your ancestor. Uh, no, I don't see it like that. I don't try to be as good as my father because I can't do that. It's impossible. I try to do my best in everything I'm uh, I'm doing, but not. Uh, I never. I, I sometimes uh, nowadays uh, wonder would my father like that or would my father wouldn't like that. But not. I'm not trying to to be as good as him because uh, I I don't think I can reach his uh, magnitude. Um, but. Um, it's not, uh, it's not a curse, it's not a good thing. Uh, sometimes it's a very, it's a good advantage and sometimes it's uh, very difficult because may, may, maybe people expect a lot from you or uh, they expect you to be like your father. Um, but I also, I always try to convince myself that I'm not my father, I'm a, another personality and uh, I'm always trying to do my best, and that's it, nothing more. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Costadina. Hello, and thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, my question is uh, like an extension of uh, Clerico's one, because I wanted to ask you uh, if at any point, and especially in the beginning, whether you had any uh, insecurities and how those insecurities uh, interfered uh, with your creativity. Not insecurities um, uh, in relation to your father, uh, insecurities about your work, uh, whether uh, what you do is enough, etc. And uh, how did you deal with them and how did you manage to control them in order not to affect your creativity, if it was possible? Very good question again. Um, I didn't have many insecurities. I was at the beginning. I was very enthusiastic, and um, I came to the theater world with uh, lots of uh, enthusiasm and uh, very sure that I'm going to make it because I have very good studies. And uh, but of course, the real life is much different than the studies. But anyway, I try to do the best that I could. Uh, sometimes, um, sometimes during the work, I felt that I couldn't uh, evolve my ideas or that I couldn't perfection my ideas. And that was quite frustrating. And that was, that made me wonder, you know, it makes you wonder, are you, am I capable to do that? Uh, is it a good uh, choice that I would do that? And um, again, I'm not like my father. My father was a very stubborn person. He didn't, uh, uh, for example, he, he wasn't disappointed by uh, bad luck or by uh, some uh, uh, obstacles that he had in his career. Um, I'm, as I, I said because before, I'm a weaker person. So sometimes they, these uh, unfortunate uh, events, uh, they, uh, they uh, had uh, bad influence in me, but uh, sometimes, somehow I over, over, uh, over, uh, overcame them and uh, everything was okay. But uh, yes, I was uh, sometimes uh, disappointed from, from myself. But I wouldn't say that I was insecure. Thank you. Very I much. was I was sure about my knowledge and I was sure about my experience to the theater because, I, as I told you, I've lived a lot into the theater and while I was a small child, uh, I knew this world a lot and I knew it very well. So um, I was sure about my knowledge and my experiences. Thank you. You're welcome.
Thank you, Costadina. Uh, uh, other questions? Let me ask a question. Um, um, Katarina, I, I don't know if I get I got this right, but I, I got the sense that some source of inspiration uh, for you have been uh, temporary and some have been uh, permanent. And you know, listening to you talking about where you got inspiration to design uh, uh, theatrical play A, B, C, sometimes your your source of inspiration would somehow shift and change. At the same time, it seems that your father has been a very constant permanent source of inspiration yes. throughout your life. Is that is that right? Yes, yes. Uh, inspiration and courage as well. I mean, I always have in mind that he 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 became what he became. Uh, after um, being ma being a person who was not really educated because he didn't even finish high school. And uh, then he had this terrible experience at the concentration camp. And uh, then he was so, um, he saw a, a performance uh, of Carolus Kuhn in 1945. Uh, as soon as he came back from uh, Austria, and he was shocked by the, the the miracle of the theater, as he said. Um, and then he decided to dedicate himself to the theater, and uh, he wanted to be an actor. Uh, they didn't accept him in the drama schools because he didn't have. Um, um, a high school certificate. Um, so he couldn't become an actor and then he decided, uh, okay, I will uh, try to write. Obviously he had it in, in him, the writing and the, the willing to write. So he started writing plays. And then uh, the National Theater didn't accept his plays for uh, some years until uh, 1950 when his first play was on stage, not in the on the at the National Theater in another theater, and uh, I what I keep in mind is his uh, he has never lost his courage. He has never said, and uh, no, I will stop now. I'm not for this. I will do something else. He he never he was never disappointed. And he was never discouraged. So I try to have this in my mind all the time. And uh, I guess there is a parallel, you know, trying to take a, a play, um, a theatrical play that has been uh, performed, produced, I don't know, zillions of times. And every time as a member of a new team, you try to interpret it in a different way to bring something to, to shed light uh, to it from a different angle. So, and I guess this is uh, what the curator does, right? As a curator, now you try to bring your, your father's work um, to the next generation, to make sure that it continues to inspire. Of course, of course. So, of course. so talk to us a little bit, considering that also 2022 is the year uh, dedicated to um, mm -hmm. his work. Uh, what would you see the, the, the relevance or the expression or the opportunities to, to revisit today uh, your, your father's work, taking into consideration all these crazy, crazy things that are happening to our world? uh today what, what do you see the fit the relevance or the opportunities to revisit and uh, reinterpret some of his work as i said before um i think uh, uh, we can uh, take example from his life uh, and that is quite enough and uh, if we read uh, his plays uh, we will see that uh, from the very early plays like uh, the Avliton Thavmaton, Courtyard of Miracles, which was written in 1956, uh, until the later one, the the last, the last one, which was written in 2005. I think you ha you can find a lot of um, relativity with uh, the uh, with the situation of the world today. Uh, it is not uh, uh, the things that he's, uh, um, he writes are not very far from the reality, are not far at all from the reality. Uh, that is why everybody in the theater, they say that they are 
they these plays are like they are written today and i think they can touch every person of today and they can touch also the uh, the young people and um, i will give you an example um my father has written the play our big circus to magalo mas circo which was staged in 1974 um just uh, before no no 1973 i think three yes 1973 just before the uh, hunda uh, was down uh, just before uh, the summer before um, the Politecnio. And um, it was written for that period of time and it was staged for that period of time. And uh, later on, uh, let's say about uh, the decade of the 80s, uh, somebody wanted to stage it again. And my father said no. It's not a play that will uh, touch people. It was written just for that period and all that. And he refused to give it again to be staged. But then in, uh, when my father died in uh, 2012, uh, a director came to me, Sotiris Kajakis, and he asked me if he can do the our big circus, the Magalo Mas Circo. And I said, this is a great idea. It was... Uh, already the time for, for uh, with the crisis here in Greece and I think it was it would be a good thing to um, to remember our history so he staged it uh, in Thessaloniki and in Erodio uh, uh, I think yes Erodio and I remember that people was crying was seeing was watching the play and they were crying which means that the play from 1973, uh, written uh, for a special occasion, it touched them. So I think every play of my father's can touch everybody at any time. They are universal and they are um, contemporary and they're classic. How about the, uh, the scripts he wrote for, uh, for movies? Because you know, uh, we talked a lot about the theater, but he also wrote uh, plays that later became movies or scripts yes. for movies. That some of them have been again, you know, very significant, very uh, the history of Greek uh, cinema. How did of you course, feel about uh, that? Of course, and I wish he could he had written more, <laughs> but uh, he didn't. Uh, I mean, the 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 movie Odrakos, the Dragon by Nikos Kunduros. Uh, I think it's um, it is considered the the best movie ever in the Greek uh, cinema. Uh, it is considered classic. It is it is fantastic. I mean, if anybody see it, uh, it's uh, it's a wonderful script and a wonderful uh, uh, direction from Nikos Kunduros uh, with the images he has created. his movies are good well not very not all of them are very good uh, because some of them the, he wrote the scripts uh, out of order you know it, he hadn't uh, done it by himself and I think the only the only movie that is very uh, Campanelli's movie is uh, The Canon and the Nightingale The Canon and the Nightingale I think it is a wonderful uh, cinema to watch. Okay, so let me uh, let me go a little bit back. I had a couple of I had a couple of observations uh, to uh, to what you you presented. Uh, many people associate uh, being creative and doing creative stuff with the future, with uh, all with what is new, and you. Uh, you emphasized a lot the importance of history, you know, to yes. know the history of art, the history of culture, the history of fashion, the history of design. A lot uh, of you history. Said, a lot of history, how much time you spend in museums. And talk to us a little bit, why is it important for creativity, for your personal creativity, perhaps for creativity more generally, to, to know, to know yes. what has come before? I always refer to history, always. It hasn't been a single moment 
uh, during my creativity that I, I do not refer to history. And I always open books, the books that I have in my library with uh, all kinds of histories. Um, because I, I, I also want to be uh, right, to be, uh, not to make a mistake, not to be, um, to do things that they are not uh, historically right. <laughs> You know what I mean? Uh, so I think, uh, and of course, uh, all these uh, masterpieces uh, of paintings and the sculptures and the buildings that have, uh, uh, that they belong to uh, uh, President, uh, woman is, uh, previous uh, eras, uh, I think they are, uh, number one source of experience of um, inspiration sorry number one source of inspiration to create something today and um, uh, let's go a little bit back to the collaborative art of the theater you uh you mentioned a couple of times that the director is the boss okay mm -hmm. so yes. let me ask uh, just as like a <laughs> uh maybe devil's advocate why why is the director? Uh... Because uh, yes, because he puts the final signature in the performance, the final signature. I mean, everybody refers to the director when they want to make a criticism on a on a performance. Uh, if the performance is not good, is the director's fault? It's all of the director's fault. And uh, and if it's a masterpiece, it's the director who has uh, done a great work. Uh, the other um, the other members of the team they come uh, afterwards. So what would you also say for me for me because I I have all these uh, very nar uh, very uh, uh, this relationship with the theater in a way. Um, I try to to see uh, the other people's work as well. I mean, it has been many times that I've seen a performance that said uh, um, the performance was horrible, the direction was horrible, but the music was fantastic, or uh, the lighting was really good, or uh, uh, the choreography was very good. So um, I advise everybody to do that, uh, to see uh, specific parts of an uh, of a. Uh, of a performance. So uh, you can, you know, in, in this field, I guess the the privilege of all of people is that you can really uh, understand their uh, individual input, right? Whether it is the lighting designer, the theater designer, or the costume designer. But in your experience, what is it? What are a couple of uh, things that make the difference between uh, less successful, if you will, or more successful director? Is it uh, the way they communicate? Is it the way they inspire? Is it the way they synthesize? What uh, is it that makes it? Sometimes the director uh, has a, a bigger opinion of himself than he should. You know what I mean? Because uh, some of the directors, uh, they think they can do, uh, they can do everything, but in reality, they can't. Um, Anyway, um, yes, in reality they can't. So um, I think this is quite destructive for a director to think that he's capable of any, everything and that his, um, his uh, point of view on a play is uh, right. Uh, I have seen many, perform many plays, many performances that the director was not right. I mean, I didn't agree, me personally. Of course, it's very sub subjective the way you see an, a piece of art. Uh, I consider a performance piece of art, okay? Um, I think this happens to every piece of art. Everybody sees uh, differently. So, um, that, is, that that would be just my opinion if the director is uh, has done a good job or not. I mean, somebody else would think that he's uh, okay. He's a, he's a good director and he has done a good job. 
Yes, Giorgio. Uh, hello, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I wanted to ask you if you are cooperating, cooperating with the uh, younger generation now with uh, young people in the theater in... Uh, in oh, yes. And uh, I must tell you that I have teached uh, for uh, many years in drama schools with, uh, uh, I, I have taught uh, theater design and uh, that was a fantastic experience because I think uh, that the people really, um, they were really enjoying that, whatever I told them to do. And um, I have worked quite a lot with them in, we have done performances in in the school, of course, but it doesn't matter. It hasn't. It doesn't. Ha it hasn't happened to me to work professionally with younger people, uh, except for actors, of course. But um, uh, my experience with younger people were at the drama schools, and uh, it was a great experience. They were. They really liked what we did. Mm -hmm. So, uh, how is the experience of teaching for you? Is it uh, interesting? Uh, is it yes, natural? Very, very. it is very interesting. It is very interesting. And I think uh, as much as I give to uh, students, that much they give back to me. You know what I mean? I take many things from them. And this is quite good, quite fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, Porsaki. Uh, good evening and thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, I believe we've uh, partially covered this question uh, after your discussion with Mr. Manomelis, but I would like to ask you something. Uh, I remember when I was at high school, I, uh, I used to play uh, in the uh, courtyard of miracles. Oh. at school, uh, which in my in my sense was characterized by the lack of stability and confidence that uh, characterizes the life of the Greek citizen. Uh, as, as, you dis as you mentioned before, uh, this uh, you have seen it throughout your, your father's plays, uh, the fact that uh, his plays are actually uh, talking to people today's people they we ha we have to to face the same issues the same problems uh how about the solutions why don't we learn and also based on your experience at the theater but also during your studies in politics which you said you didn't you didn't finish but i feel that somehow theater and politics are related and i would like to ask do you have a solution about how we can uh, overcome these problems that we have been facing for years now thank you Quite a difficult question. <laughs> um, yes, um, the, the truth is, as I said, that the plays are touching a lot of people. They touch a lot of people. Um, my, solu my solution, no, I wouldn't call it a solution. I would call it an advice, especially to you young people, uh, would be that uh, you should follow more of the culture. I mean, you should you should get occupied with the culture more. Uh, I don't know how I, I, if I express it well in English. Um, in, when I talk about culture, I mean um, to go and watch a good uh, movie or a good uh, theater play or um to what to listen to good music uh, and with good music i don't mean of course only classical music i mean uh, good music is also pop music or uh, other kind of rock music um, and don't waste yourselves in a kind of uh, amusement that uh, you think offers you uh, relaxation but it really doesn't offer you relaxation. It, uh, it minimizes your, uh, your imagination and your, uh, uh, your will to, 
to uh, to uh, evolve. I don't know if I if you understand me. <laughs> I would say it better in Greek if I could. Uh, but uh, anyway, I think um, I think culture is uh, is a good way. Um, like I don't understand when people say I don't read books. What does this mean? I don't read books. Why don't you read books? I mean, books is a great education. It's a great uh, it's a great way to to get away from problems. Um, good uh, good cinema, good films. I mean, things that might make your mind work. That is what I mean by culture. And I think that is my basic advice. And I think if you if you work with culture, if you bring culture into your life, I think you will see things differently. That's all. Thank you very much. I couldn't possibly more timely than the, the, the what we're experiencing uh, in the last decade, right? It's so relevant, all the yes. archetypal things that um, especially theater, not only theater, but especially theater has been addressing. I mean, to me, Electra, uh, you read the story of uh, Electra and Orestes, and it's so relevant <laughs> to what is happening in the world of civil unrest, you know, in our days, and we talk about institutions and about the city. It is so relevant. and. Uh, uh, it's an interesting question, you know, Saki said, why don't we learn, but at least theater, you know, it's a kind of uh, a we will work. never learn. We will never learn from history. If history repeats itself, unfortunately, because people forget, maybe. And that explains why we need the timeless messages found in, uh, in great culture again and again. Yeah. Um, let me see if we have any other question from the class. Uh, Folks, any other comments? Anything would like to ask uh, Katarina to address? All right, let me ask one last question then. Uh, considering that this is, uh, I would like to ask you what uh, what have you uh, planned for, uh, what is planned you and the, I guess the Ministry of Culture for uh, for the year, you know, given that this year is dedicated to, to the work of Jacobus Cabanelis, what type of activities, uh, what, what should we, expect to, to experience in the next uh, 10 months? Okay. Um, the first is a album of a big album uh, uh, with my father's life and uh, work. Uh, it's going to be a left coma. I don't know how it's called in English. Um, it's going to be big. It has everything in there all the references. Uh, after that, uh, we will um, we will have the exhibition that I told you before at the Benaiki Museum, uh, which we are preparing it now and probably it's going to open end of February or uh, beginning of March. Uh, then uh, there are going to be um, two conferences, one in uh, Paris and one in uh, London um about his uh, work of course and his life uh, probably something will happen at the no at the uh, south of france but nothing is really certain right now because nobody knows what will happen with covid 19 i mean the conference in paris would uh, have would have happened by now it would have happened at uh, the beginning of January, and it was postponed because of the COVID, of the situation with the COVID. So we can't really make uh, real plans. Uh, we have things in mind, uh, like uh, um, the conferences I told you about, uh, but I don't know when they're going to happen. Uh, on the same time, um, uh, uh, the embassy, the Greek embassy of Sweden uh, is uh, very keen on doing something in autumn uh, to do two, two things there, one about his work and uh, life and one day about his experience in Mauthausen. 
Um, this year, I would like to attend uh, the festivities in Mount, the commemoration in Mount Housen, if it happens, because last year it didn't happen. Um, that's all for the moment. And of course, uh, many performances from theaters. Ah, right. in, a few day, in a few days, there's going to be the Courtyard of Miracles as a musical in uh, Megaro Musikis, uh, which would be very interesting to see. And uh, the same play will be uh, on uh, from, the, by, from the National Theater in, uh, the, in autumn again. Great, excellent. We're, we're, we're looking forward to it. And how about the uh, activities in the, well, some activities in the, the museum in Naxos? Have you planned uh, something? Yes, yeah, something will happen. I don't know yet what. Uh, I will go to Naxos in a few days and to discuss it with the mayor and the, the other people there. Excellent. Okay, Katarina, thank you so much for, for joining us uh, and for the presentations. Uh, and uh, we wish you uh, wish you the very best. And we look forward to um, to the activities and the publications uh, and course. all for this year. Thank you so much for coming and for sharing with us your thank uh, you your very experience. Much. Thank you very much for having me in these very nice, interesting master classes you're organizing. Hopefully next time we'll have you with us. We'll be in uh, we'll be in our auditorium without COVID and without the yes, snow. Without yes, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Katarina. You're welcome. Have a good evening. Thank good you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.